Good morning, everyone. My name is Tirana Watago, and this week Australia saw something momentous. Two days ago, Thursday, in Canberra, our federal government, along with the Referendum Working Council, uh, Re Referendum Working Group, released the proposed wording that uh, we Australians will be asked to vote on in this year's referendum. Exciting. It, it is a milestone. Standing alongside Prime Minister Albanese was Auntie Pat Anderson, member of the Referendum Working Group. Yeah. In the room was Lucy Davis. Yeah. Also, sister to one of the main ringleaders of this change, Professor Megan Davis. And then watching live online was Larissa Minicon and Safina Stewart. We're gonna hear a little bit from them about their reflections on this historic moment. But first, what do we know? Australians, we will be going to the polls sometime between October and December. We are voting in a referendum, a referendum being the only way to change Australia's federal constitution. It will be a binary question, a simple yes or no answer. And we need nine million Australians across four states to vote yes to get this across the line. But what is this? The voice. Enshrining an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in the Australian Constitution. The voice's function will be to make proactive representations to Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth, or to respond to Parliament and the Executive go um, Government of the Commonwealth. That's it. It's as simple as that. But you know, the road to today has been long, arduous and heartbreaking, and in fact, um, the first calls for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice emerged politically 85 years ago in 1938. And since then, the road has been littered with landmarks of reports and inquiries, working groups, councils, all calling for the same thing. Give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples a voice. So let's turn now to our esteemed guests. Um, and we'll go along the line. If we start with you, Aunty Pat. For each of us, um, just introduce yourselves, please. Tell us who you are and um, what, why the voice is important to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm from the Aliara Nation, which is a very long way from here, not in terms of geography. Um, but the distance that my community, the one that my mother was taken from um, in the early, we reckon, 1930s and incarcerated in Darwin. It's a very long way from Darwin. If you go to Mount Isa, keep going across, that's it. you come into our country there which straddles the Queensland and Northern Territory borders. However, for all of that history, she was one of the luckier ones, and I say that because she was old enough to remember where she came from. So we always knew that we were Eliara and we were able to take her home several times during her long lifetime um, in Darwin. Darwin was a, seg a segregated town um, we grew, in which I grew up. All of my, I have five sisters. Uh, we all grew up um, in Darwin in a segregated community, like I say. You know, we'd have the open air cinema. All of us would have to sit down the front. We didn't come in the main door. We had to go to the side door. Um, to come in and uh, when I was growing up in Darwin the only job available to me was to be a cleaner. There is nothing wrong of course, of course there isn't with being a cleaner but the point I'm trying to make is that was the only option available to me. Both of my older sisters were cleaners and my mother took in washing and ironing and that's how we um, survived in this segregated town. I mean you could buy a frock but you couldn't try it on. In fact, it was public policy of the day to not teach my mother to read and write. 
I am the first person in my family to go to university, but not from school. I left school when I was 15 because there was no expectation that I would ever do anything, so I would go to work. Um, so I worked um, in those days. I don't know whether most of you won't know the name either. I was a stenographer. I went off and did a 12-month course and learned to write Pittman's, Pittman's shorthand. And that's how I started uh, my working life. I'm the first person in my family, my extended family, to go to university. And I didn't go from school, as I said, but as a mature age, I had to sit the uh, entrance examination to get a place. I'm putting that because there's a real, there's a long history to where we've come to. This was a momentous day on Thursday. Generation after generation after generation of us have said, hang about, this is our place, this is our home, and we ain't going anywhere. So we started this not long after 1788, in fact. Um, all of these people here, Pastor Ray, Arnie Jean, and we heard from Uncle Norm earlier, we all share this kind uh, of history. And it's not ancient, it's not old. We're talking about in each family, you know? We have in the Northern Territory, we have 10-year-old boys locked up in prison cells in spit hoods. Babies, they are 10. How do you think you're going to correct that? So we just keep making generation after generation of distress and anger and what have you. As Pastor said earlier, it's got to stop. For goodness sake, stop it. This country isn't going to survive. The Mother Earth is already crying to the whole universe. Stop it. So it's a big task, but it's a very, very long one. We have nowhere else to go. We've set up our own organisations. Um, uh, which have been done away with um, by the wave of a pen. We've been trooping to governments all from all of our organisations from all over the country to the new government saying who we are, you need to maintain the same level of funding for our families, our communities and our organisations, don't forget us. But worse than that, every new government starts back to ground zero as if nothing has happened. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, <laughs> we did that? 20, 20 years ago, and it didn't work then, so how's it going to work now? And if Blackfellas were a business, we would have gone bankrupt generations ago. There's not millions of dollars that goes to us. There is, in fact, billions. But it doesn't get to us. It doesn't get to us. The Productivity Commission said less than 30% actually gets to us. So the real needs, which is what The Voice is about, to attend to all the things that um, you talked about, Uncle, and this... We call it in the Uluru Statement, the torment of our powerlessness is to begin to deal with this trauma, to heal. So we don't keep, each generation keeps doing, and the governments of the day keep doing the same, so there's no change. And I've spent a lifetime in this space, and all of us, all of us, nothing's worked. Nothing's worked. And it's not necessarily because of your bad people, but the structure doesn't work for us. I don't think it works for you either, quite frankly. So there has to be change, fundamental change that is going to turn everything up on its head. Now, change, as you all know, is very confronting for a lot of people. This is the most, probably the most significant, all of us, are, thing we are ever going to do, all of us, all of us over 18. This is going to be a very difficult, because people don't like change, as I said earlier, and we're asking for a big change. We're asking to turn everything upside down and on its head. And really basic, fundamental right, you would think, oh, we know it is. When you're making laws and decisions for people, surely you have to have them at the table to include them. And that's never happened. We have lots of organisations. Look, to say there haven't been any achievements or benefits, there have. Of course there have. But I have to add, the corollary is that it was all our own work. It was through our activism. Not because we have a benign government and say, oh, there's poor blackfellas, let's give them this. Well, it does happen, but in the wrong way. So um, it's been through our activism, as I said, which started in um, 1788. And I have to endorse what Pastor Minikin said we heard this in the dialogues going around across the country and the word reconciliation was used and the older people in particular 
would look at us, look at Megan and I and say, reconciliation, but we've, we've never met. We've never met. How can, there be, how can you come together after a struggle when we haven't met each other? So I'm very wary, lots of words, as we all know, that uh, are used and can cause distress or anger very easily, very quickly. I have to say, with no disrespect to anybody, but we do live in a different world. There are, there are two people in this country. There's you and there's us. Um, there's no other way um, to say that. So we're going to try and heal this, deal with the disadvantage that we constantly feel and be recognised in, in our own country as its peoples. You know, in 67, uh, I, I wasn't a citizen and I couldn't vote and I wasn't counted. That's not that long ago, so we've only been citizens for a short time according to, according to the law, of course, but we have been here. The latest figure I read, because as a scientist, tools get more sophisticated, uh, that dump number gets getting pushed back. The last number I read was 100,000 years. So, I mean, how long do you have to exist in a country? It's, you know what? It's now getting absurd. It is now getting absolutely ridiculous. We're running out of arguments now. And today, uh, Thursday rather, the Prime Minister put on the table the question that's going to be asked. Only, only one way to answer, yes or no. It's a very simple question. We can't get to all the information and disinformation that you're going to hear across the country for the next month. It's going to be endless. It's going to be hateful and it's going to be very unpleasant. So there's only, as I said, the only, those, only one answer. That's what they're taking to them. So that will solve a lot of the naysayers that they'll be picking every word apart over the next few months. But it's a, it's a good question. It's very clear and it's very simple. And the other thing that he released for, uh, in, in uh, uh, response to this clamour for detail are the design principles for the voice. They're available, they're a public document and that everybody can read them and say what the voice will do. Now, the naysayers and all the people that have been clamouring for detail, um, they know that in this country our democracy tells us we only vote to a ref referendum on principles. We're not voting on a model or anything that's in concrete. You get yes first and then you do the detail here and then you include all the people that it's for in that process. So we get a yes vote. <laughs> then the next issue for us all is to put what we're all calling a meat on the bones. But you have the framework now. You, everybody can, all the voters can see what the voice uh, will do. So... That's what's, um, that's what's face, uh, facing all of us, all of us over, over um, 18. Um, it's a really important time. I'd ask you to, um, this is a bit of a do-it-yourself referendum as well, because the expectation is that you will um, read and, dis and talk and discuss amongst yourselves the pros and cons of this. Um, but um, so you all have to be <laughs> become educators. So you can talk, not addressing forums like this, but just in your family, people you work with. When you hear somebody saying, oh, this is a lot of rubbish or it's nonsense and you're going to hear lots of things, uh, I think we all have to be brave and step up. However, this is going to sound terrible. I'm not, I'm not asking or expecting any of you or anybody in the whole country to put themselves into um, a difficult situation. Um, so you need to um, protect yourself and be careful. Sometimes it's better to just shut up and walk away. Because some people, you're never going to change their mind. We know that. Do we think Peter Dutton's going to change his mind? No, he isn't. And I think he's indicated that quite a lot. Uh, Pauline Hanson isn't going to change her mind. And that's okay. We know that, so we don't have to go there. You know, it's, it's fine. I'm not, it's not a criticism of other them, but, you know, so I'll just use them as an example because you can waste your time. We've got a valuable time here. We've got a job to do. I might be quiet now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Lucy. I'm a Cobble Cobble Buttergum woman and a South Sea Islander woman from Ombay Island in Vanuatu, similar to the Minicons, Aboriginal Kanakan. Um, 
I am the Rap and Strategic Projects Coordinator for the Salvos, and I've got some Salvos brothers and sisters in the house. Woo! Um, what was the question? I forgot. Who are you? Who are you? Oh. Um, I just want to acknowledge Uncle and his welcome, and thank you for welcoming us here. Me and uh, my nephew, who... I always say that because I am his auntie and he's older than me, so he's my nephew. Um, and my other auntie, Auntie Jean, we all come from the same community. Our, f our family was taken from a place called Warra, outside of Toowoom Dolby, um, on the Condamine River. We're called the people of the Western Downs. We're the care caretakers of a place called the Bunya Mountains, beautiful mountains that we call Buni. We live and breathe the law of Buni. And the Bunya Mountains was a place where clans from southeast Queensland would gather and we would sit in circle. And that's how our business was discussed. We would talk about our men's business. Well, me, we wouldn't. We, we could aspire, but um, <laughs> women's business, marriages, conflict. One of our senior men in our family, Uncle Noli Blair, would say to us, if them mob in Canberra would do things like we would do things, sit in circle, where you don't have a position, where you don't have a barrier, mm. when you're all, where you're all equal, mm. where you practice deep listening, hey uncle, mm. then maybe things would, would have got done faster. So we have a similar story to you uncle and to Arnie. We were taken off country. We were placed in Baramba Mission, known now as Sherberg set up by the Salvos. I say that with a smile because after I joined the Salvos, it wasn't until my uncle goes, yeah, you know, the Salvos were the ones who set up Baramba Mission. I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> so when we go home, they say things to me like, you mob need to get your stuff together. And I go, me mob? I'm part of you, I'm your mob. No, I'm talking about the Salvos. Um, but um, being the youngest of the Davis clan, I've been on this journey with Annie Pat and my sister um, since 2017 and beyond that. Um, and I have to say that the Salvos have been on the journey. We were one of the first churches, faith-based organisations to support the Uluru Statement. And it wasn't under my leadership, it was under Shirley Kongu's leadership. Um, I, I didn't know I was fighting with my sister at the time because she couldn't return my calls. Um, <laughs> and she said to me, do you know the Salvos has signed the ACOS petition? And I was like, are you serious? And um, Cheryl, only Shirley led that for us. And then I've taken over the baton. Um, and it's been a massive journey for the Salvation Army. Um, we've got a I was, I was giggling when Uncle Ray was talking because he was talking about churches and raps. Um, Shirley said to me, I was, in, I've been, I was in her team since 2016, um, and she said to me, oh, the Salvos are moving into one... one I, I, I see. I was going to say one nation. <laughs> <laughs> one Australia, okay? One Australia. Um, and um, we, we, we need a national rap. And Lou, I think you sh you'd be perfect for this. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'll give it a crack. I don't really like raps because they can be really tokeny, right? They can say things like, we're going to employ a million Aboriginal people and they've got one. Um, so when I went for the position, I was really excited. But I also said to, the, to our senior leaders that this action has to be action. It can't be action without a movement of people, that everyone in the army has to understand what our position is and where we want to go with this. And it can't be just changes that are visual. It has to be infrastructure changes. Um, and that I also thought that raps were tokenly. And they, they gave me the job, believe it or not. Um, and I've been in it ever since. Um, but two weeks after I got the position, my sister, writes this scathing article on raps <laughs> and ripped them apart and I rang her and said, what are you doing? I just got this job. But hats off to the Salvos who have been on the journey. We've made some massive changes. We've been on a journey together. We believe that a part of our ministry 
is ministering in this country together and sharing our shared history. What happened to Aunty Pat, me, Uncle Norm, all the black fellows in this room, happened to you, Mob, too. It's your history as well. This is why when you hear things, when you come to a, when we're going to a referendum, when people say this is about race and division, having your First Nations people acknowledged in your constitution, what's more div- what more causes more division than that? Do people not see us? Do they not hear us? I think that's something that really has always stood out for me when people say, why are you creating division? We, you, well, we're invisible. If we're not acknowledged in the founding document of our country, that is the guiding, guiding document to create laws about us and we're not acknowledged in it or recognised, then who's being divisional? This is about us coming together and creating a new country, a new history for us. Because it's all of our history, the hurt, the pain, the ugly, it's all of us. And I always take what happened during, um, when we did our rap yarning circles, we did them virtually. I always say I was, I thought I was going to be acro- going across the country because I always say, so I always are like Mac is A, we're on every corner and every country town, <laughs> we're everywhere. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be cruising around talking to all these salvos and COVID hit. And I was like, oh, I'm at home with my kids. <laughs> Trying to do these virtual yarning circles. Um, But the one thing that really stood out for me and something that really hit home was Black Lives Matter had happened during that time. And our leaders in the army came out and they were talking about how Jesus would protest, that there's stories and scriptures through the Bible about him protesting, about him being rebellious. And what are we doing sitting down Why aren't we with the most oppressed in our country? Why aren't our churches full with First Nations people? I used to say to, I'm based in Brisbane and where our our building is, I used to say to our Salvos mob, yeah, Jesus ain't here in DHQ, he's out there at Musgrave Park with my mob. He's sitting there. He doesn't want us to be in buildings. He He wants us to be out there. Anyway, I'll wrap up now. I talk more than only Pat. Um, but it was really unbelievable. Was un- Merv was in the room with me and it was amazing. We were in the Prime Minister's room. Here's a little bit of history that will go on forever in Parliament House. Um, I spilt my chai latte in the pr- Prime Minister's room. So my chai latte stain will be there in Elbow's room. Um, I know this is AFL country, but um, Albo is actually a mad Rabbitohs fan. I'm a mad Roosters fan. And he called security and told them that they were going to kick, they they had to kick me out. And I'm looking at him going, are you serious? You're the Prime Minister, man. You can't do things like that. They'll think I'm a terrorist. Um, But can I say, the moments before we walked out, those tears were genuine. The moments after, and I don't know if anyone saw it, but there was a standing ovation from senators and other politicians as we walked back through the hall. Me and Merv thought we were famous. They weren't really clapping more at Aunty. Aunty Pat was the star because she walked at the end and she didn't realise. But there was a sense of love and a sense of really coming together. And there was silence, wasn't there? People like Uncle Pat Dodson, who led the, the commission into raw deaths and custody, Aunty Marcia Langton, these leaders, Aunty Pat, these leaders who have been at the forefront of these battles for our people. And what Aunty Pat and Marcia are saying is true. There are programs that have worked. There has been advisory councils and advisory panels and leaders and whatever else that has worked. The issue is is that when a new government comes in, it's stripped away. So then the good progress that has happened falls to pieces and poor Aunty Pat has to then go back to Canberra and tell her story. Uncle Norm then has to sit down with the newest politician, Uncle Ray, Aunty Jean. We have to start again. With a voice 
It means that the next incoming government, we pick up where we started. It means that community programs that work in Redfern, that work in Sherberg, that work in Yirrkala, those programs, they get a voice. And that's important that the things that are working on the ground are acknowledged and recognised so they can keep doing the work that they're doing. Now I'll be quiet. Thank you. It's, it's tricky when you're in a listening space to then go into a talking space. So I won't look at you just yet. Um, <laughs> My name is Safina, that means Noah's Ark in Arabic. Joy, that's the most courageous expression you can ever get, most risky because it reveals all. Stuart, which comes from a Scottish heritage, but that's okay because my, as well as my husband having Scottish heritage, my father has Scottish heritage. And so I am grateful for all of our family coming together and having and making home together. Safina Joy Stewart, that's who I am. I'm not my job, but I love my job. I'm not my calling, but I love my calling. And I love who I'm serving, which is not the church. It's not people, it's my Jesus. And my Jesus has changed my life from being in a place of despair, and I've got a lot to despair about, but to a place of courageous, engaged hope, forward stepping. That's not even a word. I went to school here, Mount Evelyn Christian School, grade four and grade five. I suffered horrendous racism here, just there behind our brother. That's where I first got beaten up. Sorry now, but this body got hurt there. The boys came and bashed me. Good thing I played soccer because I know where to hit the knackers. <laughs> And I fought back because I knew what they were doing was wrong. And my mother had taught me that I was precious. My body was sacred. This place was sacred. So you stand for the sacred. So when I kicked and then ran, I was standing up and giving voice to a tiny little girl who was suffering injustice. I never even planned to tell that story there. It just came because that grass told me to tell it, so. <laughs> Redemption is real. Reconciliation is possible. But it only happens if we stand in hope. And if we have faith in each other. I'm really worried. Like what Uncle was saying. I'm worried this ain't going to go the way that I'm hoping it's going to go. I'm really worried for my kids. I have the three most beautiful kids and no one's allowed to touch them unless I let them because they are everything to me. And one day I'm going to have the most amazing grandchildren and then great-grandchildren and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that this planet here, our home, will still be able to look after them and I'm going to teach them how to look after this home. But this voice to me, I can't believe I'm alive at this time, actually. I'm just, I, I don't actually feel like I'm equipped to be alive at this time, or this year, or today, or right now. But I didn't get to choose, so here I am. And so therefore now I get to choose. And I look at all of you, beautiful people. I know so many people here and you've done story with me in my life. 
And I thank you for coming again and again and again. Yes, I see you down the back there, Miss Turquoise. Because that camaraderie and that solidarity of friendship and continuing actually proves that I can have faith in you, despite what I fear most, which is the no. I'm worried about the violence that's going to come. I've learnt from the violence that has come before. This grey hair has been earned, and Auntie Jean still calls me a young one. 20 years ago, at surrender, 20 years ago, Auntie Jean called me and she said, she was looking at me, we were talking about painting up crosses here at surrender, and she said, bub, we need your mouth. And I'm glad I'm still here, at the foot of the cross, like Auntie Jean said, sharing truth and sharing heart. But I need all of you, eh? I need you. I don't know how many we have here, but if we're like the 3% represented here, you the 97. And um, Aunty Pat was telling us last night, even if we all voted yes, us five, <laughs> we wouldn't get it over the line unless the majority here got it over the line and we had the double yeses. I haven't realised how much I've needed the rest of Australia until bloody this year. Sorry, I've been saying that one, but so did Uncle Norm, so. <laughs> but now I'm really realising that my life is in your hands. Our life is in your hands. I'm a recovering, assimilated, colonised black woman, evangelical actually too. <laughs> I grew up being told, not necessarily always directly, but enough messaging for me to completely collapse every essence of my identity, that it has taken a lot of work to recover my identity. I am Safina Joy Stewart. Ni Fergie, ni Bingarup, ni Taripara, ni Mabiog Island, Wutiti country, that's who I am, it runs in my blood. You see this colour? That's my sea, that's my ocean, this is where my grandfather would go pearl diving and fishing, where God gave him the ability to breathe underwater one time when he got been stuck. He saved another man's life and he came up and he was under for 45 minutes. God gave him the chance to breathe underwater. I come from the mermaid people. That's my grandfather. He with Jesus now. I guess what I'm saying is I'm just like you, but not. I'm reliant on you. Maybe you're not reliant on me. You don't think you're reliant on me, but you are reliant on me. You rely on the knowledge and the wisdom that comes through me that I can hear, like what Uncle Rabin talked then, that comes through and out. You rely on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Christian leaders to be able to hear what the spirit creator is saying, what the land is saying, and translating it into your concept of world right now so that you can make gospel make sense for this context right now. So that salvation is actually real, not old, now. You need us, mob. But at this moment this year, we are really needing you. Probably the majority in here are already decided that they're going to vote for the three-letter option. <laughs> That's just a plug right there. <laughs> However, you may not have said yes to standing up and speaking out, to activating your prayer life and activating your walk life. So my hope by being here, if the question is why are you here, my hope is that my courage to stand up would encourage you to stand up and that together we would speak out and give voice, to raise voice and bring on voice. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Ah. Uh.
are my white brothers and sisters. I am appealing to you on behalf of my people to raise your voices with ours and help us to be a better, help us to be a better deal in life. In a word, to grant them all the rights and responsibility of democracy. Who do those words belong to? You don't know. Those words belong to Annie Pearl Gibbs. She was born in 1901, the same year the Constitution was born, to an Aboriginal mother and a white father. But she honoured her Aboriginal line. She could have chose to be a white person living in Australia. That woman started the 1967 referendum. And she screamed to her brothers and sisters, we want democracy. This is what changed. This is why we can sit here, is because of this woman called Arnie Pearl May Gibbs. Because she saw and understood and lived the life of it, what it meant to be an Aboriginal woman in this country. We want democracy. This is what the voice is about, democracy. So I stand here as a voice because I want to be able to set, bring a voice that was, you know, Ani may be passed, but her voice does, still lives on. To be honest, that's who I'm doing it for. For Aunty Pearl May Gibbs. For the life that she lived. For my grandfather. You know? For, you know, all those mob that didn't get the right to vote in 1967. You know, I do it for Aunty Pat. I do it for my sis, Megan Davis who have to walk the corridors of that most oppressive place called Parliament House. You know, it's not a safe space. My, me and my niece have walked that path. That we have to sit here and convince you of our human rights. That we do not have democracy in this country. We are the minority. <laughs> but this is our country. When we get democracy, then we can start talking reconciliation. Yeah? I just want to say this. When the naysayers come, one of the things that you need to understand, and I'm saying this for black fellas as well, check your privilege. What is the pro proximity of your privilege that gets you the right to have a service, the right to have an education, the right to have access to food, the right to have access to water? Who are the ones that are you are not hearing from? Because that is your privilege that you get to have access to all of that. And I'm saying this to black fellas as well, who are saying, no, we want treaty, we want sovereignty. But you look at who, where they are. They are in urban areas who have access to, to services. They have access to privilege. We need to hear from the remote mob who are saying, we want this. This actually came out of Uluru. <laughs> we need to hear it from the, the diverse voices that we represent. And this is what the voice is about, diversity. Diversity of democracy. So I ask you, when you hear, you know, the conversations from, you know, our mob or from white fellas or from whoever, check their privilege. Check their privilege. And so, you know, are they closer to the information? Are they closer to, you know, having access to stuff?
but this is what we are fighting for, access. This was, I'm, I'm going to bring it to a close. <laughs> No, but I mean, this was outstanding. Like, you know, we didn't have a little conference beforehand to figure out what are we going to say, what are we going to do. We were just, we all just had the quiet confidence that the Spirit was going to lead us where um, we needed to be led. And so, um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all your perspectives. You have given the audience a lot to think about how to engage with the voice. So thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, panelists.